So I'm going to read a, a little bit out of a book. It's called Bits and Pieces. It says, No doubt you have heard this one, but it's worth repeating for obvious reasons. The value of courage, persistence, and perseverance has rarely been er illustrated more convincingly than in the life story of this man. Failed in business, age 22. At the age of 23, ran for legislator and defeated. Age 24, again, failed in another business. Age 25, elected to legislator, legislature. Age 26, his sweetheart died. Had a nervous breakdown at age 27. Ran for speaker of the House and defeated, age 29. Defeated for elector, age 31. Defeated for Congress, age 34. At the age of 37, was elected to Congress. Age 39, defeated for Congress. And again, age 46, defeated for Senate. Ran uh, on the ticket as vice president at age 47 and was defeated. Again, ran for Senate at age 49 and was defeated. But at the age of 51, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States. Talking about somebody not giving up, that, that illustration just kind of sets the tone for today's message. Our life can give us many ups and downs. We can go good, we can go bad. But today's message is called, Don't Lose Heart, Press On. Now we can receive a blow that can knock the wind out of our sails, as we might say. We just don't feel like moving forward anymore. It, it makes you wonder how Abraham... Lincoln felt, how did he feel after all these defeats, all these setbacks? I wonder how he felt. What made him keep going? You know, we can lose our desire to press on with life pretty easy. So, so the question is, how do we act when, when we get knocked down? How, how do we act when things um, don't go the way we expect them? When we get sucker punched out from, with a left hook out of nowhere? I wonder how many times Abraham Lincoln said, okay, I, I, I have got it figured out this time. It's, it's going to work. I know it's going to work. I'm going to run for office, and it's going to work this time. And then he gets defeated. Then the next time, man, this is a sure bet to win. And what happens? He gets defeated again. That has got to be devastating. So we should ask ourselves, how do we act when disappointment sits in with us? How do we act when things don't go as, as, as expected? We, we plan every little detail about something and we try to execute the plan, but it just doesn't go as, as planned. How do we react? Stephen was the first Christian martyr, right? First one that was a, a a, a martyr for the way, for the modern day Christian movement. And he was being questioned in front of the high council because they felt threatened by him, right? And during his speaking to the high council, there's a little segment in there in the book of Acts where Stephen was given an account of Moses. He says, one day when Moses was 40 years old, he decided to visit his relatives, the fellow fellow Hebrews, the, the Israelites. When he did that, he saw an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite. So Moses came to the man's defense and avenged him, right? Killing the Egyptian. And then Scripture tells us Moses assumed his fellow Israelites would realize that God had sent him to rescue them. But they didn't. The next day he visited them again and saw two men of Israel fighting. He went in, he said, I, I, I am going to take care of this. I'm going to be the peacemaker. 
And they said, you brothers, why are you fighting? And they said, who made you, who made you the judge over us? Who made you the big shot here? When Moses heard that, what did he do? He fled the country. The easiest thing to do when you face a problem is to run from it. it, will, it, it I'll be the first to admit, I'm, I'm bad about that. Major problem, hey, I'm running, I'm gone. But we will say, let's not deal with it, let's just avoid the problem. That makes things a whole lot easier. Let's just avoid it, put the cover over the can, we don't have to look at it. Hey, that's easy enough, right? So what did Moses do when things got at, didn't go as he expected? He fled. I'm sure Moses was like, look guys, look what I'm, I'm trying to save y'all. Uh, look what I have gi- I'm giving up. And you guys are so disrespectful. Y'all don't appreciate what I'm doing here. Things didn't go as he expected, so he fled. He just knew that the Israelites would receive him with open arms, right? But they didn't. So how do we, when we, how do we act when we, put, when we put all this work into something? We, we plan every last detail and it just doesn't go as planned. Do we get discouraged and flee? Or do we get back up and press on? Even Jesus himself said in Scripture, says that all men ought to pray and not lose heart. Discouragement does not come from God or Jesus. That's right. Discouragement does not come from God or Jesus. It comes from Satan. Amen. Amen. Jesus knows that we. <laughs> Jesus knows that we will face many obstacles in our life. We will get knocked down many times in our time here on earth. We will face many disappointments, but we must press on. Or as the British say, we must soldier on. It's not how many times we get knocked down that matters. It's how many times we get back up that matters. Trust me, we will face opposition, disappointment, frustrations in this lifetime. During a Monday night football game in 1980, between the Chicago Bears and the New York Giants, one of the announcers observed that Walter Payton, the Bears running back, had accumulated over nine miles in career Russian yardage. The other announcer remarked, that is awesome. And that's with somebody knocking him down every 4.6 yards. Walter Payton, the most successful running back ever known, even, even the best, he knew that even the best gets knocked down. The key to success is to get up and run again just as hard. I want to look at another man in the Bible that faced many obstacles in his time here on earth while he was doing the work for the Lord. He was a man that got knocked down many times and kept getting back up. If you have your Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. And I'm going to say a quick prayer before we get too started here. Lord Father, I, we just pray that we can receive this message you have for us today, Lord Father. Lord, we pray that we can receive it with open ears, that we can see it with open eyes, Lord Father. Lord, we... we we pray that, that we remove any distractions, Lord Father. We, we, we just concentrate on you and what you have for us here today, Lord Father. Lord, I pray for the strength to deliver this message, Lord Father, and to get out of your way and let your, your message come out. Lord Jesus, in your holy name we pray. Amen. Apostle Paul was a man that faced many setbacks and had many opportunities to get discouraged with his time of ministry. <clears throat> Scripture tells us five different times that Jewish leaders gave him 39 lashes, three times he was beaten with rods, once he was stoned, three times he was shipwrecked, 
Once he spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. He has traveled on many long journeys, faced dangers from rivers, from robbers, faced dangers from his own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. He faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. He faced danger from men who claim to be believers, but are not. He's worked long and hard, endured many sleepless nights. He's been hungry, and he's been thirsty. He's often gone without food, and has shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep him warm. Sometimes I think when, when we realize that we're not the only one that goes through problems, that we're not the only one that's facing major setbacks, or we're not facing devastation, or we're not the only one that's being devastated by something, things seem to be a little bit easier to manage. We don't feel like this is such a big disappointment to everybody. We, we, we realize we're not the only ones that face all these massive setbacks. I mean, just look at this list of what Paul went through. If, if any of us face just one of these things, just one of these things, you would probably be put in the Martyr Hall of Fame. Now in the third chapter of Ephesians, Paul is so excited to reveal, to reveal that the salvation of, of Jesus Christ is not just for the Jews, but it's for the Gentiles also. It, it, is all, it is all for all to receive Jesus Christ with open arms as long as they accept Him as their Lord and Savior. God's will for Paul was to spread the good news to everybody, not just the Jews, but Gentiles, everybody. But while Paul is writing this letter, where is he at? He's in a prison cell in Rome. If you look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, that's where we'll start here. You know, think about it. Talk, talking about great first impressions... You're writing a letter of encouragement to people while you're sitting in a jail cell. Hmm. Verse 13 says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Do not lose heart translates to not give in to the evil one. Do not give in to fear or feelings of hopelessness. Do not give in to discouragement. These feelings are just as prevalent in Paul's days as they are in our days. Paul did not want, <clears throat> did not want the Ephesians to get discouraged because he was in jail. So he tells them, do not lose heart at my tribulations. But we can also look at this message as a way of not getting discouraged with what we face in life. In another letter, Paul even goes on to give the Corinthians some advice. He says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, this foundation, this tr truth to stand on, as we have received mercy, this, that is, this gift of mercy from God, we do not lose heart. Therefore, we do not lose heart, again, he says in, in 2 Corinthians. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. The soul, the spirit, is being renewed and blossoming day by day. It's getting stronger and stronger. Receive your glory, which is the boldness, confidence, access in Christ. Paul goes on to talk about some reasons not to lose heart over his situation. You might say Paul's giving us some instructions or ways to keep from losing heart over your current situation you're facing in your life. Whatever that giant is that you're facing, Paul says this is his prayer for us. Verse 14 says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord. He's getting on his knees and praying for the Ephesians. But we can also look at this prayer for ourselves. 
Let's look at verse 16. Ephesians 3.16 says that He would grant you, He would grant you, He would give you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner, inner man. That is that He would grant you, that He would give you, that He, that he would gift you according to the riches of His glory. That is His greatness, His power that He would greatly give to you if you get on your knees and ask Him for this power. Ask Him for the strength to overcome the temptation of giving up. To be able to overcome the evil one's power of discouragement. If you ask, He will strengthen your inner man. He might not strengthen your outer man, but He will strengthen your inner man, that is your spirit, your God and force, your God and spirit, which we all fight against. Paul tells us in verse 14, get on your knees and pray and ask for strength. God will provide you the inner strength that you need to overcome any obstacle in your life. But first you have to be ready to let go of whatever it is that you're holding on to. You've got to be ready to give it up so you can move forward. Let's look at the next step here. Verse 17 says, That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love. First, we acknowledge we need the Spirit of God to empower us to overcome obstacles in life but we also need to open our hearts and let Jesus Christ come into our heart as a guiding force. We need to realize that we need His guiding force in our life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When we are strengthened by the Spirit of God in our life, then we give Jesus the ability to do something with our life. We have the confidence and boldness to walk the walk. When our faith is rooted and grounded in the love of Jesus Christ, just like a massive tree is rooted, then we allow Him to dwell in our hearts. That is to set up a permanent residence. That's not just to come stay for a while that's like to set up camp, set up a permanent residence in our heart, to dwell in our heart. When we have this kind of faith in Jesus, this allows us to I'm sorry, this allows us to rely on him to carry us through hard times. See, Maddie, I'm not the only you're not the only one that gets tongue tied. So. When we have allowed Jesus to set up residence in our lives, we are not shaken by every storm that passes through our life. We are rooted. We are on a foundation that is stable. We turn and we face the storm head on. We will look at the storm and say, bring it on, let's go. I'm rooted in Jesus. You know, if you think about it, for an airplane to take off, they always have to head into the wind. They always head into a headwind to be able to get the resistance and the airflow over the wings to lift off. To be able to soar in your life, we have to look at our problems head on and take them head on. Many of you maybe have heard of the, a man named John Wesley born uh, June 28, 1703, died May 2nd, 1791. He was a great th theologian, uh, Bible commentator, uh, evang evangelist, evangelist, but he was also the founder of the movement that started uh, the Methodist Church. Here's an excerpt out of his diary. 
It didn't say what year, but this was an excerpt out of his diary. Sunday, May 5th a.m., priest in St. Anne's was asked not to come back anymore. <laughs> Sunday p.m., so he's doing two services, I guess. May 5th, preached in St. John's. Deacon said, get out and stay out. <laughs> Sunday, May 12th, a.m., preached in St. Jude's. Can't go back there either. <laughs> Sunday, May 19th, a.m., preached in somebody else's house. Deacon there called special meeting and said, I couldn't return. <laughs> Sunday, May 19th, p.m., preached in Meadow, filled behind church, chased out of Meadow as bull was turned loose during service. <laughs> That's one way to get rid of them, huh? Turn the bull loose. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Woo, look out. Oh, my goodness. <clears throat> June 2nd, a.m., preached at the edge of town, was kicked off the highway. June 2nd, p.m., afternoon, preached again in a pasture. 10,000 people came out to hear me. When you're facing heavy enough resistance that's making you want to give up, to, to, to give in to discouragement that you're feeling, I mean, I would, that would just have to be so disheartening. You put, pour your your heart and soul into a message and study it and, and you just do this is what you want to do and you feel led by God and you get kicked out of every place you go to preach. Man, that's got to be disheartening. That would have probably once, maybe twice, I'm, I'm done. I'm, yeah, I can't do this no more. And then the bull chase you. I mean, now that's, that's, that's okay, I got the point. Y'all don't want me here no more. You let the bull out. But that's got to be disheartening, right? That's got to be discouraging. But we have to remember, we first have to get on our knees and ask God to strengthen our inner spirits. To open the door to our hearts, to allow Jesus in so that He can set up residence in our heart. So that He can be rooted and grounded in our love for Him. So that our roots of faith in Him will run deep. And they're not easily ripped up by every storm that comes through. It's like the trees. You see, some trees are just blown over real easily by a tornado. They got shallow roots. Pine trees. You see an old oak tree, it's still standing, right? That's how we want to be when we face these storms of life. When we do this, we're, we are able to understand this next verse Paul gives us. Verse 18. <clears throat> It says that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height. I would like to speak the words to you of Dr. Grant Richardson on this verse. I, I just, there is no, I mean, this is just, the way he explained this is just beautiful. It says, with this phrase, we have the scope of God's love for us. Width is the comprehensiveness of God's love expressed in the mystery of the church. Length is the length of time throughout the ages His love extends. Depth represents how, how far God will go with His love. Height indicates the, re the reach of His love extending to heaven. We just barely hit the tip. I mean, just a fraction of the tip of the iceberg with our understanding of the magnitude 
of God's love for us. But when we begin to, to, under, to, to just even, I don't even know that we can understand, but if we begin to head in that direction of understanding God's love, His magnitude of His love, brings us to verse 19. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. It all boils down to trust. Even Cooper said so. When, when we learn to lean on God and ask Him for the strength that carries through our trials, we open our hearts to Him and allow Him to set up a residence in our heart, make a permanent residence in our heart, then we begin to understand the magnitude of His love for us. After all of this happens, then we can boldly and confidently walk in the fullness of God. We are able to press on and not lose heart. God tells us through Jeremiah, He says, For I know the thoughts that I, that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. The magic happens when we learn to take that leap of faith and trust in God to carry us, to deliver us, to let us soar like eagles in the sky. Not to worship fear, but to worship God, the God of endless possibilities, to worship the, the, the great deliverer, the great I am who I am, the great restorer. But for all this to be possible, the first step is to trust Jesus and run into His open arms. Jesus says, I'm knocking. I'm knocking at the door. You just need to open and let me in. If you don't know Jesus, but you feel tugging at your heart today after this message, that's Jesus knocking on the door for you. Take the first step and open the door and let Him in. Tell Him you believe, uh, you believe that He is the Son of God, that He died for your sins. He rose from the dead after three days. Tell Him, you're a, Lord, I, I know I'm a sinner and I need Your help. I'm asking You for Your forgiveness. Ask Him to be Your Lord and Savior and be willing to repent. Ask everybody, please stand.